Hey everyone, I'm Kelsey Heenan from HitMax, HitBurn, and The Daily Kelsey. I'm excited to be here. Kelsey, so excited to have you here. Thanks. I'm so pumped to be here. It's going to be so much fun. <laughs> yeah, so I just love your message. Um, just, it's so well-rounded. It's so authentic. It's genuine. It's not manufactured, which is just so powerful these days. Um, and, and really, as most people listening to the show, they're trying to lose weight and on that path and that journey of self-transformation. And you have an amazing story, and I know you've told it time and time again, but uh, for our listeners, I think it's just powerful to take us kind of back maybe to 2008 when it all started transpiring um, to, to that time. Yeah, definitely. And what I would love to share, like if your audience is mostly people who are trying to lose weight and you know get fit in that sense, there are a lot of similarities between my story and other people's stories that everyone can relate to no matter what their physical goals are, because a lot of it starts with the mindset. And so I think a lot of what we are going to dive into will kind of come around to that. But basically I was an athlete growing up, always loved sports and it was a way that really helped me establish some confidence in myself. I was always really shy. Like I would never be able to do this talking to you right now <laughs> because I, I just, um, I, I had a really hard time being able to, uh, talk to strangers and just, I just wasn't super confident. So sports was the way that I really developed that. And so I eventually, uh, played in college and that was something that was a huge goal of mine. And I was able to do that, but once I got there, it was kind of a big shocking thing because so much was different than what I was used to. And it was one of those things where it really just threw me out of my comfort zone completely. I moved across the country. I didn't know anyone. And it was a really high level. It was a very small school, but we were playing, um, you know, D1 schools, some of the top schools. And it Vanguard, just... right? Yeah, Vanguard. Yeah, yeah. So uh, back then we won the national championship my freshman year, which was so much fun. Yeah. Can't um, imagine. But to step in from high school, no matter how good your high school was yeah. back in Minnesota, right? And then all the yeah. way to California. Yes. I mean, that's so many transitions. Totally. And you know, as an 18 year old, I had no idea what I was doing. I mean, no one really ever knows what they're doing, but sure. <laughs> especially at that young age, it was, it was a hard transition for me. So, uh, my freshman year was, we were super successful as a team and that I loved that piece, but I really wanted, I was a perfectionist growing up and I wanted to be the best that I could be. And so I wasn't getting a lot of playing time. So I thought in that, you know, period of time, how am I going to be able to get an edge to be able to get more playing time. And so for me, a lot of that was, okay, I need to eat healthier. I need to work out harder. I need to be able to, yeah, basically just become a better player overall. So I started incorporating more workouts beyond the, the team workouts. I started, you know, making healthier choices that I thought they were at the time. And with all of this stress, it kind of just really spiraled for me into something that was really scary. And I didn't realize that it was happening. And I developed anorexia throughout my college years. And it was, it got to the point where I was so sick that I basically lost 30% of my body weight within a few months. And I didn't have any weight to lose at the time. I've, I'm an ectomorph, so that I'm, I'm a yeah. taller person and I'm naturally a more thin person. And I, I just dropped all this weight because I put in all of these super rigid rules and was working out constantly. And I, I just spiraled. And so my, my, my boyfriend at the time, who's now my husband, uh, he, he, basically confronted me after all of these really scary situations happened and was like, Hey, something's going on. I don't know what it is, but you need to talk to your parents or I'm going to. And my mom flew out the next day and brought me to the doctor. And the doctor said, Hey, we have to stop all physical activity because your heart rate is so low. You're, you're so medically unstable that you could go into cardiac arrest if you went for a brisk walk, like just That's crazy terrifying. things. Yeah. Just things that you, you don't think about, but like, malnutrition is incredibly serious and yeah. the the type of activity that I was doing was just so excessive that I had no idea what I was doing to my body. And I was just, I hated well, could you, Yeah. So, could you even think at that point? I mean, I'm just thinking like when you're not getting the right nutrients, you're not getting enough healthy fats, like the chance of being able to even rationalize and, and process the information to realize what you're doing. I would think your brain function would be off. Oh my gosh. It was, 
it was really scary because these things kept happening where like, for example, I, I went to the, or I went to go pick up my mom at the airport. I got lost for two hours. I could not find the airport. I mean, this is, this was not a complicated drive. I was in orange County going to London yeah. and Google maps existed, <laughs> but I was like, for whatever reason, my, my brain could not get me there. And I was crying. I could not figure it out. And it's scary because I was like, what is going on? I've always been incredibly responsible and really could always trust myself. Yeah. And it, this was something that really scared me. And so th there were these situations and, and these things that happened around food where I would have these intense anxiety attacks. Mm -hmm. If I was presented with a food that I thought I shouldn't eat or a certain amount of food that I thought I shouldn't eat, I just had these intense anxiety attacks where I would just go ballistic. And that was completely out of character for me. If you, if you know me at all, I'm always a generally happy, even keeled person. It takes a lot to get me worked up. And these were just completely uncharacteristic for me. And so, yeah, you're completely right. Like my, my brain was just not functioning and it was really scary. Yeah. 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 So when you're, you're, you're starting out, you're trying to do this from a positive place. Mm -hmm. And then it just like that scale just kind of tipped mm -hmm. and, and you said it happened pretty fast, like 30% yeah. of your body weight in months. Um, but you also said your husband, Dennis, who is your boyfriend at the time kind of saw stuff. Now I'm curious because you know, I want to, when I working with a lot of clients on the fat loss side of things, um, we have to get to this place where we're accepting everything and not judging it from a food standpoint. And so there's a lot of hiding and that hiding is tied to shame and guilt around certain foods were you doing that around Dennis at the time? Did you find yourself kind of, I mean, it sounds like he intervened, but was he intervening throughout the process because he saw the whole thing? Or was there a lot of hiding? Was there a lot of shame? Or were you completely unaware still at that time? Kind of both and. So hmm. I was incredibly ashamed of my behaviors, but I also didn't really realize how dysfunctional they were. And, you know, people who, who, haven't been around eating disorders or people with them don't fully understand all of the behaviors either. And so it's the kind of thing where like Dennis had no idea what was going on. I mean, he, yeah. in a sense where I was like, no, I'm just not hungry. I'm not going to go to the cafeteria today where in my mind I was terrified to go to the cafeteria because of all of the food options. And I didn't know how to make choices anymore. And so like, I, I didn't go to the cafeteria for months because I was terrified. And he was like, Oh, you're just not hungry. Or you ate earlier or whatever it was where it was really me like having this intense, uh, eating disorder behavior. And you know, he, he didn't see me at every single meal where I would, you know, eat a literal like tablespoon of oatmeal. And that was my breakfast. And just like, like, and then I wouldn't eat all day. I mean, it was just really intense things, but, um, yeah, so he would start to notice things. And I mean, he definitely started to notice my weight loss. Um, but it, it's really, it's not like his fault that he didn't understand right away. No one knows right away. But when he did start really noticing some of these behaviors, he was like, okay, this, this isn't you, this isn't, this isn't normal. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, do you think any of that was spawned from any kind of childhood stuff with what you were taught or, you know, ideologies or images or what you picked up? Or was it all just this kind of spiral from trying to be better and just having more of a type A type personality? Yeah, that is so interesting. And that's something I've been thinking a lot about lately, because I've been hearing about some research that genetics do play a piece in it that, that, um, I, I would need to go to the specific study to sure. get all the specifications of it, but that there could be a, a one specific gene that is a component of it. And when it's in the right environment, it can be triggered into some type of eating disorder. And so that could be a potential. And I even went to UCSD to participate in this study where they did an MRI brain scan to, to kind of see how my brain reacts to different types of triggers and fear and things like that. Because there are also different studies where if a, a person with anorexia specifically like sees or hears about sugar, it lights up a different part of their brain than someone who doesn't. And so the, it's really interesting to think about, okay, maybe there's a genetic component to this and um, beyond just, you know, perfectionism type A type stuff. Yeah. Um, but also I think environment is really important. So I feel very mm -hmm. lucky and blessed that my, my parents never talked 
badly about food or their bodies. Um, but I do think that I, I maybe put some of these things, you know, just with media and put some of these things in place where I I put labels around food as, as good or bad, just based on what society was telling me and what I was reading and had a lot of, you know, these misconceptions and beliefs based on what was around me just as a person growing up in the world. And um, then also what I've really noticed a lot too in talking with other collegiate athletes and, and women, a lot of women that I've talked to, and I know that a lot of men struggle with this too. So it's not just a gender thing, but a lot of women that I've talked to who were high level athletes said that it can be a really toxic environment when you are playing at such a high level, when you are surrounded by other people who of course your teammates, but you're also trying to, to be able to get more playing time and, and get an edge and all of that kind of stuff. And just with all of the dieting, you know, advice out there, it can be a really challenging place to be in. Yeah, no, that makes sense. And I think you're right. I think it goes both ways, men and women, but definitely women get it more. And especially on the, the athlete side of things. I mean, we can go back a few years and look at like Shaq was the big boy, right? Like he was a big boy, but that was a positive thing. Right. It wasn't, and that's coming from the media since you mentioned the media. Yeah. You know, and yet we, we wouldn't see that with, with female athletes yeah. to the same degree, you know, they're, they're still judged um, by their image, you know, it's, mm-hmm. and so that's a detrimental thing instead of just their playing ability and, and whatnot. So I, I'm glad you shared that for sure. Yeah. It's, it's a challenging space, but I think awareness is a really important thing to, to just bring to the table. And that's how we work through it. Yeah, no, that's, that's so powerful. So you got to tell me, uh, you got to tell listeners about the pizza story. Cause that was kind of the catalyst for everything. And I personally resonated, um, about this time last year, I was, I was just getting really, really lean for a photo shoot cut. Um, and, uh, Cody, uh, McBroom was my, my coach at the time for that. Um, awesome guy in the nutrition space. And, and, uh, and it was my birthday and my wife made me this cake and I like had anxiety about eating a slice of cake to the point where I was like, can you fill me in on everything that I had broken down in it and everything? And I was just like, whoa, this is one tiny, tiny little scope into that world of what someone deals with who is dealing with any kind of eating disorder and the anxiety around food. Um, and I was having a panic attack about it, you know, and it was like a celebratory time. And I'm like, wow, this is how quickly this could just catalyst. And you're in deeper than you even know how. And I know you have a, a powerful moment like that. And then the stuff that transpired. So um, definitely mm. want you to share. Oh, I, I love that you, not that you experienced that, but that you're willing to talk about that. Because like I mentioned at the very beginning, like not everyone is going to develop an eating disorder, but if you were to survey, you know, everybody in the world, my guess is that 99.9% of people have experienced some sort of challenging relationship with food or exercise or their body or confusion around it. And it's important to talk about these overall like concepts, because if we can, you know, repair that relationship with food, it makes everything so much easier. And, you know, you can reach your goal so much easier when you have that like more, uh, well-rounded understanding. So that's super powerful. Uh, yeah. It just gave me empathy in that, yeah. you know, in, in, in an area that I hadn't before on the losing weight and being, you know, overweight and struggling and all those things that was, it was easy to tap into from past history, but on that scope I hadn't. And I was like, Whoa, you know, there's, there's so much. And it's definitely an area I still don't, don't touch, you know, it's a refer right. out and, uh, you know, let people that have been there. So, um, so you're, yeah, you're, cause I think that like a lot of people associate like you have to be a super skinny person to like experience those things or be a certain amount of leanness for that to be valid. But there are so many people in, in at every body size experience these anxieties and these fears. And so it's important to like, be like, that's okay. And, and we can work through this. And it's not just the people who have a diagnosed, you know, anorexia nervosa that can experience this. So, um, any, so yeah, anyway, with my pizza story, it's important to understand that it's, it is like, there are diagnosed eating disorders and then there are also disordered eating behaviors. And 
difficult relationships with food. And, and so it's important to talk about, but pizza. So <laughs> I was in college and it was the 4th of July and Dennis, who is now my husband, boyfriend at the time, we ordered this big pizza and I, you know, it was something that I hadn't eaten in a long time, but I was like, okay, yeah, let's do it. And so it gets delivered. I open up the box and it's just this ooey gooey, like cheesy pizza. And to everyone or the vast majority of people, they'd be like, oh my gosh, I'm so pumped on this. It looks so good. Winning and for, yeah, right. Ready to celebrate independence. Uh, but for me, I opened it up and I was just filled with fear. I just instantly burst into tears and was like, I cannot eat this. This is, I, I just can't. I don't know what this is. I have no idea what's going on, but I cannot eat this pizza. And I was just going ballistic. And Dennis was like, what is going on? And it was so confusing. And that was one of the first kind of anxiety attacks that I had around that. And it was so confusing because I was like, yeah, I haven't been eating these types of things, but I've never experienced this type of uncontrollable like fear. Yeah. And so I, I, I couldn't eat it. And that was really the first time where I was like, okay, there's really something going on here. And I need to like, maybe look into this deeper because this is not normal behavior. Jeez. Yeah. It was, it was not fun. <laughs> yeah. And then from there, did you seek treatment and like professional treatment or, or was it a recovery on your own or? Yeah. So there, there was a period of time where like, that was my first experience. And then more experience is very similar to that happened and the over-exercising continued. And then, you know, there was that point when my mom flew out and we went to the doctor and the doctor was like, you are completely not stable. Um, you have to like stop exercising. And that was really scary and the worst. And you know, I didn't listen to it at times, which is not good. But basically at that point, my parents like knew that I needed some sort of ultimatum. And so they worked with Dennis and basically were like, you have all these things coming up. You know, we were, we were actually, you know, gonna get married and like I was doing school and like all this stuff. And they're like, there's no way that you could even consider, you know, doing more school or playing basketball or getting married if you are this sick. And so they, they basically gave me an ultimatum or like, you have to get some sort of treatment and, and start, you know, digging into this now. Otherwise all of these things aren't going to happen. So I did get professional treatment. I went to UCSD. They have um, a family-based therapy program there and I was the first young adult to go through it. So I was 20, 21 when I went through it and I was with, a uh, 16 year old, a 14 year old and like a seven year old. Um, and it was a really humbling experience for me because yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, it was, it was, um, one of the most challenging things I've ever been through, but also incredibly transformational for me. That's huge. Yeah. Well, I'm so glad you're, you're on the other side and yeah. using that pain as power to impact so many lives and, and share messages and, and, uh, and wake people up. And, and so what I was curious about as you're talking, you know, are there signs like if someone who is listening today is going, yeah, I kind of resonate with that. That's me. Or, uh, or someone that's going, yeah, I know someone, you know, my, my daughter or my sibling or coworker, like I, I see them going down that path. Like what are the signs that they can look for? But more importantly, how can they encourage, um, either themselves to go, uh, seek help or, you know, someone else? Cause it's probably a really, delicate thing um to help someone see stuff and encourage them to go without being pushy or and hopefully not having to get to that ultimatums uh type of situation so what advice do you have great question so it really is a hard thing because a lot of times when people are experiencing eating disorders they feel like they're in complete control to a certain extent that mm -hmm. that the choices that they're making are bettering them and so it's, you know, confusing and also infuriating if someone approaches and is like, Hey, this is actually not healthy. And you're like, no, this is the most healthy thing that I could be doing. So yeah, yeah. it's this really strange thing where it's like, it can be a really delicate thing. And so 
if you are noticing that someone, I mean, there's a lot of different types of eating disorders too, but like with anorexia specifically, if it's the kind of thing where you notice that a person won't eat in front of other people, if they will only eat certain types of foods and start uh, displaying fear around certain types of foods, hmm. um, are only eating certain amounts, are obsessed with calculating the amounts of food that they're eating. Um, yeah, there, there are lots of different things, you know, and then physical, there are also physical signs too, if there's a, a huge amount of weight loss right away, things like that. Um, over exercising, obsessively, compulsively, you know, exercising, those are types of things. And I, I think a lot of what you said too of, of hiding is, is really interesting as well and something that a lot of people go through, uh, whether that be in a, a binge eating disorder situation or in an anorexic situation where people have a lot of fear around eating around other people. And so that can be something that uh, could be a sign as well. Yeah. And then as far as what to do. So professional treatment for eating disorders is, is so, so important. And I can give you a list of different resources that I like to give out of, of different types of options for different types of eating disorders. That'd be great. But, Plug them in the show notes for sure. Yeah. Yeah. But seeking professional help is really important when it is a, an eating disorder specifically, because the, the faster you get help, the faster you're going to start feeling like yourself again. And it's, I just know so many people who have suffered for so long and like, I know that treatment sucks and it's like, I don't need it. I'm fine. But deep down, it's like when you do just give that little bit of surrender to, to be able to work through it, it like, it's worth it. <laughs> like I, I, I didn't want to talk about it for a long time because it was so painful even after recovery. Like I didn't want to talk about everything that I went through because it was so painful and it sucked so much. And I also didn't want to be like labeled as, you know, the person with the eating disorder or, you know, who had an eating disorder and I just wanted to be me. <laughs> and so I, I didn't, I didn't want to talk about it, but now that I, I'm, you know, in December, it'll be 10 years since I went to treatment and, you know, went through that recovery process and like, after a few years, I was like, I have to talk about it because there's so many people who need that encouragement. And I feel like so far removed from it now that it's like, I can talk about it and be a source of light for them. Yeah. Love that. So do you find that for, cause you mentioned, you know, a lot of people who've been in that specific situation. Um, uh, I'm the only person I can think of who, who references these two terms is Gretchen Rubin talks about the abstainer versus the moderator. And, mm -hmm. you know, some people are the abstainers, which means they actually do need to stay away from a certain stimulus. And it's usually like type A type people. Right. Um, you know, I know for myself, there's a certain, certain few foods that I need to abstain from. Otherwise I literally will, like if it's ice cream, you know, we go out and buy ice cream with my son and get a scoop. Otherwise, if it's in the house, I'm eating the whole carton all in one sitting guaranteed. Yep. Right. And then it's just the emotional triggers and traumas and they go with that. And, but I don't need to abstain a hundred percent. I can go yeah. get it every, you know, in, yeah. in moderation. Um, but I'm just curious because I know you're huge on intuitive eating and, uh, and I love when clients can get to a place of intuitive eating, but I feel like there are a few steps yeah. that typically have to happen before, not always. Um, but do you find that people who struggle and people who are, are able to come out on the other side are more on the moderator type of side or standard type of side? Do they need to get to a place where they can kind of moderate everything just talking intuitive eating in general. Um, I know that's open and vague, um, yeah. but you triggered some things and that's why. Totally. And that's such a good point. And there are a lot of different approaches that you can take to figuring out like what is, you know, what is a, a true balance for, for myself? And a lot of people have a lot of different opinions on how that can work and people have seen success in, in different ways. My personal and professional opinion is that there are some things that you need to be able to get in place with the mindset before you can truly experience freedom around nutrition. And whether that be someone who is experiencing uh, restricted behaviors or someone who just doesn't know what to eat and you know just wants to tone up or lose a little weight or whatever, or someone who is experiencing more binging type of situations or you know overeating consistently. The mindset is so important, and this is a big piece of intuitive eating. So 
when you, when you kind of dive into the different principles of intuitive eating, there are some things like no food is off limits. Now that's one of the, the principles. And that's something where it's like, if you tell most people that they're like, huh? Like right. that makes no sense whatsoever. But it, it like, if you really peel back the layers to internalize what that means, you're like, Oh, I get it. So, yeah. so like what that means is that, uh, you like no food is off limits. You could eat any food at any time. And so many diets out there are like, Nope, you can't have this. You can't have that. Right. You're only allowed this at this time in this specific amount. Now, yeah. if you, you find to, yourself not socializing, not being with friends, yes. just, you know, and then falling off. Yes. Adhering to this, the dieting rules. And when you, when you do that, a person could see physical results right away, but how sustainable is that? And are they going to be able to, like you were saying, like go out with friends and live their life and everything. And it's so, so having no food off limits is a general umbrella saying you could have any food at any time. And that takes away the pressure of dieting rules where people feel like they're always making a mistake or feel like they're completely falling off track. And when you, when you truly have that mentality, it allows you to make more informed decisions. You can be mindful about food choices to make healthy choices for your body, for performance, for health. But you can also, you know, have some flexibilities built in. And so certain yeah. things like, like no food off limits, listening to hunger and fullness cues and honoring your body in the sense that my body is the only person or the only being that knows what my body needs. A calculation isn't always going to know exactly what my body is feeling because this calculation that's telling me to eat 1,832.5 calories per day doesn't know that I crushed a leg day yesterday and that yeah. I also went on a long walk with my dog and that I burned a ton of energy. And so I might be more hungry today than I was on the day that I just watch Netflix all day. And, and, and you may have had a rough night of sleep and then yes. your stress may be high from some business stuff. And then, yes. oh, right, yeah. Totally. Like all those factors are so important. So it's like with intuitive eating, it's there, it's just a more of a, like a mind body connection and an awareness around it where um, the first phase is really like understanding that and isn't specifically about weight loss. It's about making peace with food, making peace with your body, making uh, sure that there aren't like dieting and anxiety and things around food. It's really about the repair. And when that is in place and you feel comfortable and confident in that, you can make some gentle adjustments to be able to make body composition changes, to be able to build muscle or burn body fat or things like that while still honoring your body in the process. And so that's, that's the, the space that I love to live in and teach with intuitive eating is making peace with your body and food so that you can go into like a lifestyle where you can understand how to feel your body well by being informed, by being mindful, but also make gentle adjustments to reach your physical goals. Because so many, like, of course, like that's an element. You don't want to be like obsessed with how your body looks, but it is a thing where people do want to make certain physical goals. And that's sure. the truth. not anything wrong with that as long yeah. as the mindset is in a healthy place. Yeah. Yeah. So it's definitely learning to love yourself and find a peace along the journey. Um, and then just gaining that kind of insight and knowledge between yeah. your relationship with food and how it's responding in your body. Yeah. Um, so, and, and I think environment plays so much into that. You talked about environment on a few things. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, what are some tips for you for helping people shape their environment? Um, you know, I, I feel like that's one of the strongest things, whether it's at home, whether it's, you know, at work, um, you know, that, that takes away so much. So any yeah. tips or suggestions on environment? Yeah. So I think the first thing is like figuring out what are the, the triggers within that environment? What are the things that cause you stress and anxiety? What are the things that are challenging to make it, you know, hard to adhere to a healthier eating choice or to be able to get in your workouts or what are things that are just causing you so much stress that you can't fall asleep at night? Um, be, just having that awareness is really important. And then at that point you can make those adjustments. So if it's like, I, you know, I eat so well throughout the day, but then at night I'm so ravenous and I just overeat. So it's like, okay, 
maybe this isn't about the food. Maybe this is about your ability to have access to healthy food throughout the day. Or maybe you are restricting so much during the day that at night you're just so hungry that you, you can't control yourself. Or maybe it's a stress thing where I, you know, I wake up and I know that I'm going to have a super stressful day. And so I, you know, don't eat because I'm so busy. And then all of a sudden I'm so stressed out and I'm so hungry that I can't control my hunger. Um, you know, so it's like figuring out like, what is it? Like, is it, is it a stressor, like a situational thing? Is it about the food? Are you not eating enough or the right types of foods to fuel yourself? Um, and yeah, just figuring out like, what are all these elements and then making those gentle adjustments. Cause I think when a lot of times when people try to, try to get certain physical results. They, they go super hard, which is like, it's admirable, right? Like you, yeah. you want to, like, I love when people are like so motivated, but motivation comes and goes. So we need to establish what is sustainable and yeah. not put in all these super crazy rigid rules so that we can actually stay consistent, get results over time and then keep them for life. Yeah. Sustainable, flexible, but still structured yes. so that you can have the autonomy, but still, still have some guidelines more than anything else. Totally. And as you're talking, I was thinking like, you're, you're basically saying instead of intuitive eating, you're in saying intuitive mindset, like having the awareness of where your mind is going with all of these things, which is a hard thing to gain. Um, which I find it's like just pulling back, you know, showing some appreciation for whatever it was. So you just ate the entire pizza, you know, so you just, you know, cried and didn't, couldn't bring yourself to eat the pizza, you know, show appreciation for the fact that you're bringing awareness to that, give some forgiveness and then figure out what that next step could be, um, yeah. to progress. But one next step, like you said, instead of like this, this go hundred miles per hour, I always get a little nervous when someone says like, I'm all in. And I'm like, I love that you're committed. Like yes. let's shift it to commit it all in feels a little bit tied to the motivation. <laughs> like, let's be careful. Yeah. So I love uh, that. And that's so important. Like, yeah, whether, whether you are, you know, scared to eat the pizza or are feeling so guilty because you ate the whole pizza or anything in between, if you feel that stress and anxiety with any amount of pizza, you know, like being able to work through that and, and that awareness is so important. And when you can have grace with yourself, that is when you can create lifestyles because you, you understand this is what's happening. I am aware of it. Now, how do I move forward? Well, yeah, we may have to call this like podcast, let go of the pizza, you know, yes. <laughs> or let go of the emotions <laughs> of the pizza, I guess. Yes. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, grace and gentle two words you keep using that are definitely resonating, um, with me. And I, I think a lot of it has to do with just the ease for us to fall into comparison, um, with everything that's around us. Yeah. And, uh, and so I, I think the comparison, then your people are listening, they're gaining some insights and stuff and they're realizing where they're at, which is always really good and, and learning to take some action on some things. But then the comparison aspect comes up and, you know, you talked about being a really shy person at the beginning. And, uh, I mean, it took me six months to launch this podcast when I even had 10 episodes in the tank, right? Yeah. Because it's like that fear of, of, you know, insecurities of, of putting yourself out there and, and what will people think in the comparison aspect. And obviously you've overcome that to be able to produce all the stuff that you and your husband and both your, all your companies have done for the world, um, in the fitness space. So you know, comparison, you're going to get people that make comments and stuff. And, and I'm sure someone who's listening can relate and go, okay, I'm getting the fuel to the fire and I'm going to step into the gym, but then like gym intimidation, you know, and just that fear of like comparing themselves within that. So love to hear your thoughts on that. Cause I know you face it and you handle it so incredibly well. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. And, you know, I, I think that I've grown a lot in that because I've gone through a lot. And so you know, you've learned so much from your darkest times. And yeah. I hope that people listening can hear my darkest times and be able to utilize that so they don't have to experience that. But so everybody goes through it, no matter who you are, no matter what you look like, everyone goes through it. And so people feeling that you're not alone. <laughs> and for me, like, well, first of all, with gym intimidation, like what I like to tell people is, like the truth, everyone at the gym, most people at the gym are so consumed with themselves and they're just eyes locked on themselves. They don't care what anyone else is doing. 100%. So, I, so I, I think that a lot, like everyone feels that at times, but it's like, you know what? Who cares? Like 
Joe Schmo over there really could not care less what I'm doing because he's so locked in on himself. Um, but as far as like comparison, especially like in the, the Instagram age and Facebook and just media in general, it's so easy to compare to other people, whether that's physical appearance or success in business or family or, you know, possessions, whatever that is, it's, it's so easy to get caught in that because people put out, you know, their, their best life and the, the one picture that was the best out of the 50 that they took. And so for me, I, I get, you know, I do a lot of videos. I do a lot of photos and social media stuff. And so I'm going to get a lot of comments <laughs> and a lot, most of them are wonderful and people being very supportive, mm -hmm. but there, there are comments that, uh, are unique and are meant to be hurtful. So, you know, I get all the time, like, why would I want to look like a man or I, you know, your arms or your abs, like they look like my boyfriends. Why would I want that? And things like that. Or like, you're so flat chested, like no boobs, like whatever, like, why would I take your glute workout? You don't have a butt. <laughs> Things, yeah, I mean, but it's like beauty is so subjective. It's in the eye of the beholder. And so it's yeah. like, it, yeah, one person's goals is another person's whatever. And so I've, I've just really learned like people, no matter what you look like, people are going to say negative things. And often it's a reflection of how they feel about themselves. And it's, it's actually, it makes me really sad because you know that they're hurting deep down. And sometimes people are just mean because they're mean. And you also got to deal with that too. Like so, there, there are certain people that are just trolls and they're just trying yeah. to get a rise out of you. And so it's pretty easy to like have a BS detector where it's like, okay, bro, like <laughs> I really could not care less what you think about my body. Right. So it's just kind of a little bit of everything with that. Yeah. No, I think that's good. Just being able to pull back and realize and you know, it's, it's like someone could look at like all, you know, your profiles on, on Instagram, which I uh, definitely want them to follow. Cause they're amazing just cause the content you put out and you do share a lot of great messages like this. Um, and most of your pictures are, you know, pretty close to what a perfect image should look like. But the thing is, if you didn't do that, it wouldn't gain the eyes of people to follow and then hear the message yes. and actually hear the message and break through. And so it's a total catch 22, but you're good about sharing the underlining and showing the realities of, of things. And so it's, it's not like putting it up to just put your best foot forward. It's doing so, so that we can have actually people hear the right things. And I think that's, that's really, really cool. Thanks. Yeah. And th I, that's something that I consistently struggle with because Instagram specifically is a visual platform. It's based on photos and videos. And so yeah. it's a reality that certain types of photos and certain videos are going to get more engagement. And so a lot of times what I like to do is when I have a message that I feel is so important, I will pair it with a video or an image that I know people are going to see. Smart. And you know, it's, it's the, again, like that catch 22 thing where it's like, I, I don't want that to be a reality. Like I want to be able to just post a quote that is super meaningful and have that be able to be seen. But like the algorithm isn't going to show people that. So, um, a lot, like I do these swipe things where like, I'll post a picture and then I'll swipe over and do like a teaching thing where I like talk about something in depth and then I'll have a caption that has whatever I'm talking about. And I like to do that because I want people to, to hear the things that they need to hear. And I know that um, that's just kind of a part of, of the game, but I also like to show the realness too. Like I have a blooper reel like where I um, like on my highlights where it's like, I mess up literally every single time I try to record a video. <laughs> so, I, we all do. It yeah. takes so much more work than people realize sometimes. Right. <laughs> like, sure. I'm technically a professional, but like, let's be serious. I screw up every single time I do this. So I try to show some of that as well, where it's like, we're all human and Instagram is a highlight reel but we can also show that we are human and that's a good thing and important to do. Yeah. Yeah. My running joke with everyone that would come into, to the gym, um, cause we didn't have mirrors or anything for that, that specific reason yeah. of like no gym intimidation. Everyone's equal here. Every shape, every size you're loved. Yeah, Let's I just get that. healthier. And, uh, but it was, I had to, you know, it's, it's gaming within anything, right. Cause we're just yeah. human and it's our, you know, behavioral psychology that we're all kind of pre-programmed and wired to go after these certain things. And so it was, you know, a focus on come in and lose weight and, uh, you know, and then once they were in, it was like, 
all right, so now we're going to work on the real stuff. So it was, it's yeah. kind of like what you're doing with Instagram. It's like sell yeah. people what they think they need or they want and then give them what they really need. And all of a sudden they're like, ah, oh, now I'm starting to make changes and this is so powerful and I get it. And so I, I appreciate the fact that you're doing that um, because it reaches people the right way and, uh, and whatnot. So, um, so a few more quick questions. Yeah. I'm just curious what you do to shut off stress. Yeah, that's a great question. And that's always something that is like something ever changing. So for me, I, I like to program in certain days where I know that I don't have to really be plugged in work wise. Um, I love a lot of things, you know, I love the work that I do, but there are still a lot of elements that are work and I need to shut off because it's easy to work all the time. So for sure, Sundays, I love to take totally off and just do whatever the heck I want. And so, you know, a lot of times I'll try to take at least part of Saturday off as well. So just certain times off, but I need to be better at taking like unplugged vacation. So that's like the next step that Dennis and I have been talking about. <laughs> it's like, let's take a vacay. Um, but also I am starting to incorporate like things just for fun. So it's like, I, we love to do movie nights with our friends and, you know, taco Tuesday and stuff like that, where it's just, yeah, just like chill, fun things that don't really, they're not like productive, but like, <laughs> they're just fun. And then, um, I want to, I want to start playing golf and I live in Arizona now. And so like, I want to take up a new kind of fun skill and Dennis and I, are, um, we're like doing rowing training. There's like this rowing competition that we're like, Oh, it'd be kind of fun to train for that. So nice. doing different things that are like kind of outside of my wheelhouse a little bit, but that are just for fun. Um, so I love to travel too. So that's something that I love to do. Yeah, no, actually, and, and before, before this, I was like, I just wanted to get a bio. And so I found your old travel blog from like oh. 2014. And I was like, they went to some cool places. And I was like, I wonder if this was part of her, like searching the world to search herself as she was going through this transition. And I didn't want to take the show in that direction. But now that you brought that, that other piece up, and I mentioned this, I got to know, was that, did that play any kind of role? Oh my gosh, totally. Like that. So, so Dennis and I, I, basically like our whole online business started, like we knew that we wanted to do something together. And so he started dabbling in the online world in 2013. And then we made this, this goal that I would join him in 2014. So in May of 2014, I quit my job and we just traveled the world basically. And it was the kind of thing where we weren't making a ton of money at the time, but we're like, we're going to make this work and figure it out. So we kind of yeah. just dove all in and, uh, you know, figured things out along the way. You try stuff, it failed, you try stuff, it works, you know? So that's just kind of what we did. And then, yeah, so we traveled all over the world. We went to like 16 countries or something like that in four months. And it was so amazing and also so challenging because we had to, you know, figure out how to make this online business work. And also traveling is so fun, but it's also very uncomfortable. And yeah. so it was, uh, it was rainy in a lot of places that we went to. So I was soggy for like two and a half months, <laughs> you know, just things like that, that you don't think about. It's like, cool. You post a picture and it's so beautiful in England, but you're like, people don't see that your right. socks and shoes and stuff are disgusting all the time. So those types of things are really good for me. And to book a last second flight, you know, whereas my type A personality was like, I have to have my whole life planned up for every second. This uh. was a really shaping experience for me to not know where I was going to stay that night, to not know what country I was going to fly to tomorrow. And so that was a really powerful thing for me to learn to let go and know everything works out. It might not be exactly how I imagined it, but it always ends up working out and I'm surviving. So that was yeah. really cool for me. Yeah. Let go of the attachment. That's, that's probably the biggest piece. And totally. uh, yeah, we can't connect the dots forward in life, but we can yes. connect them backwards. So you kind of just got to ready fire aim and just go uh, so what's a uh, favorite place you've traveled then ah uh, so many for different reasons iceland was one of the most unique places i've ever been so incredibly beautiful i loved I went it like two years ago so i hear yeah. you yeah nice did you go to reykjavik roasters yeah uh no not the roasters but we were okay. all all over reykjavik are you a huge awesome. coffee fan yes Huge. Cheers to that. Yes, I love it. <laughs> Mine's yeah. over there. But <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Yeah, for those that are just listening instead of watching, I just raised my coffee mug, which yeah. <laughs> I you know, always have. Um, oh, man, I feel like I missed out. So, yeah, but we went all over, and I, I still love the, the the running joke. Like, if you ever get lost in Iceland, like in an Icelandic forest, stand up because there's no trees, really. 
and it's so like it's so true, true you know yes. so um so then favorite coffee since you're a coffee drinker and uh, i it's so funny like a few months ago dennis and i did this like running list of like our favorite places ever um and we were like okay let's choose our top three in in the u.s top three international and we ended up having 10 on each like we could not choose I respect so, it. yeah but but portland has a lot of really great coffee um, i would assume yeah yeah so i would say portland is one of my favorite cities for coffee very cool very cool uh, I know this is completely off subject, but have you ever been like down into a country and done any kind of coffee roasting tours, like picking cherries and all that kind of stuff? No, but I want to. Have you? Yeah. So my dad took me when I was 14 because he owns, uh, for the last 25 years, he owned his own coffee shop. What? Yeah. In, uh, in Pasadena, California. So, no way. Um, and actually he'll be retiring and closing uh, probably when this airs, um, you know, at the, the age of 70 something, just still oh, kicking ass. And, uh, but yeah, when I was 14, took me to Guatemala and uh, we, we lived on a coffee finca for a few weeks and picked coffee cherries. We dried them, we fermented them, we roasted them. It's amazing. Like met all the locals. Like, so that's something for you as a traveler and someone who yeah. likes experiences and stuff and loves coffee. Yeah. Got to do. So um, I'm, I'll, I'll send you a, a contact who he, he takes yeah. people down to his coffee finca down there and his coffee's phenomenal. I am 100% doing that. I'm so excited. That's so cool. Yeah, you'll, you'll have a blast. So fun. cool. Okay, so I know we're gonna wrap this up. Um, I got to know one fun thing about your dog because everyone knows I'm a huge dog person. You probably heard my dog snoring a few times during this podcast. <laughs> oh, gosh. Okay, so I, for people who haven't seen my stuff yet, my dog is on my Instagram all the time. She's a mini weenie dog, so a little dachshund. Um, Oh gosh. One fun thing about her. Um, she's like a stuffed animal. So she is the laziest thing in the world. So she like literally will sleep anywhere and you pick her up and she just like will lay there completely like dead, but alive. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Uh, one awesome, amazing, fun thing about your husband. You've talked about him a lot. So he sounds pretty awesome, dude. He's incredible. Uh, he is the biggest visionary. And he is always coming up with new ideas. And it's really inspiring to be around him because just, you know, not, not just like fitness business ideas. He'll see something and be like, oh my gosh, like, wouldn't it be so cool if you created a coffee shop that looked like this or had an app that did that? And it would make this so much easier if we had it this way. So it's just really inspiring to be around him because he's always dreaming of, of new things to create. And so it's always something new and fun. True creator. I love that. And, yeah. and I was, when I, I, I saw an image of him and I was like, saw like him and his glasses and stuff. And then I saw him like, you know, shirtless and fit in a picture. And I was like, he's like Clark Kent and Superman. Yes. And then I read something and they're like, yeah, they're the Clark Kent of fitness. And I was like, it's so spot on. So yes. it's so funny. He totally looks like Clark Kent. <laughs> yeah. So you, you did well. So that's great. Yes. <laughs> um, one piece of fitness equipment, if you could only have one, so not one exercise, I want you limitless with that. But if you could only be tied to one thing, kettlebell, dumbbells, barbells, whatever it is, what would you go with? Pull up bar. Yeah, I dig it. I dig um, it. That's a really hard question though. I know. <laughs> Cause I also love, yeah, I love everything. I love kettlebells, I love I love barbells. But I'm going to go with pull-up bar. <laughs> cool. Cool. I dig it. Sweet. So before I ask my last question, then uh, where's uh, where can everyone find you? Um, whatever you've got. Yeah. So my personal Instagram is the Daily Kelsey, K-E-L-S-E-Y. And yeah, so I talk a lot about the things that we talked about here today with relationship with food and exercise and helping people repair that relationship and also be able to work towards the goals that they want and stay consistent. So that's a great place to, to find me personally talking about this kind of stuff. And then I also have a fitness brand with my husband, Dennis, and our par partner, Michael Morelli. Um, so Dennis and I started HitBurn in 2015, and then we merged in January with HitMax. So cool. we, we basically just brought our companies together, and now uh, we still have the two individual Instagrams, but it's one company. And so, um, yeah, so we have HitBurn on Instagram, we have HitMax on Instagram, and then also HitMax.com is a great place to find our, our bands, our app, all that kind of stuff. 
Yeah. And it's all like really good stuff. And I know, you know, she just said that she's like, yeah, I talk about what we talk about here on, on the daily Kelsey, but there's also tons of great fitness content. So exercise demos, workouts, everything. So uh, I'll link all that up in the show notes for sure. So appreciate that. Last question. Uh, what do you believe it truly takes to transform? Transform your mind and everything will follow. It's, it's so important to start with that. And it's not the sexiest thing to, to think about, but it truly is transformational when you, when you work on these things just consistently, you'll be able to see the physical results and it will translate not only into your fitness, but into everything in life. Beautiful. Well, Kelsey, so spot on. And thank you so much for your time sharing vulnerability and authenticity throughout this entire hour. I greatly appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Such a fun conversation and yeah, so fun to connect.